Hey, welcome to Cradle Block. We're your hosts, Gene. And V, we interview people in creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We ask people on Twitter if they had specific topics they want us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. And today with us, we have Lauren Fowles. Hi! Hi, Lauren. Hello, how are you? Thank you for having me. You're great. Thank you Thank for coming you on the show. Thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> yeah, you've been a, a dream guest of ours for quite a while, and we've yes. just been we've just been working towards this, trying to get more in fact. Oh, thank you, thank you. And now we can stop the show because we yeah, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody, this is the last episode. Um, but it's a it's gonna be a doozy. Uh, you have had a amazing long career in animation. You've done so many things. You've worked so many jobs uh worked on so many amazing shows created shows um yeah it's it's a lot we're gonna we're gonna try our best to get through as much as we can of uh of your life and career but for now lauren yes tell us for those who might not know who you are and what you do oh okay i am lauren faust and i am in animation i guess but the mo for the most part an animation producer um, mm -hmm. But through my career, I have been an actual animator back when people put paper between their fingers. Um, mm -hmm. I've been a storyboarder, a writer, a director, um, and a creator and executive producer. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yes. There's a lot of yes. different things. <laughs> when V uh, did her, her drawing prompt, the stars just kind of fell off the, 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 the image because there's so many different positions that you've had. It's great. I think it's going to be so great to kind of like hear um, how you rose through all of these different roles and how that shaped uh, you as a producer. Um, I, I do want to kind of go all the way back to kind of how did you know you wanted to do animation how did you decide on this this path and um what school did you go to um well um myself and uh, my brothers showed a talent and interest in drawing very early in our lives um i understand i started drawing around the time i was three um oh, wow. and um as i was growing up I found that um, I was still watching cartoons while all my friends were growing out of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, luckily, I had my youngest brother was born when I was 10. So I had this great excuse to um, to uh, continue to watch cartoons while, um, you know, and not be horribly embarrassed. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then there was a point, I think, around the time I was in middle school, it occurred to me the first time that making cartoons was actually a job you could have. Mm -hmm. And um, as soon as I started thinking down that path and researching it, uh, I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, because I just, I loved it more than anything. Um, I'm still in love with this medium. And um, I, the, the, the way to express story, um, I just don't think anything beats it. So it's like a lifelong love. Um, uh, I, gr I grew up in Maryland and Pennsylvania and um, moved out to California when I was 18 to go to CalArts, um, like a lot of people nice. I'm sure you talk to. And um, I was not only- Not that many actually. Oh really? Yeah, you know, it's mm -hmm. not the only place anymore. It's probably, yeah. you know, more of people around my age. Um, and- uh, I, uh, you know, I was only there for two and a half years. I got lucky and one of my teachers encouraged me to apply for a job and I got it. So I didn't, I don't even have a degree. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, no. Nice. That's kind of what I heard too. It's kind of like when you go to CalArts, you want to get hired ASAP. Right. It yeah. just, it doesn't do you any good. I remember yeah, talking to my dead. stepdad about it and he was like, no, you have to get your degree. And my mom was like, mm -hmm. do you need it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Once you have a job, what's the point? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we try to mix it up. I mean, we've had CalArts people for sure, but yeah, like you said, like the, the landscape has changed and there's so many different ways to to break in and, and with the access to like online portfolios and things, you know, it's just, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's definitely different than it, than it used to be. Um, what was your first job straight? Uh, well, I guess during your, well, while you're in college, <laughs> <Yeah. Cowards. laughs> my first job was a, was a summer job. Um, 
on a small little production for MTV called The Max. Um, oh, wow. And that was a very uh, short gig. I think it was just over the summer. Um, so that was my very, very first job, but kind of emotionally and personally, I consider my first job. Uh, I got to be an animator. Uh, and this was the job that my teacher um, encouraged me to apply to um, animating on a movie called Cats Don't Dance. Um, oh, yeah. oh my God. Yeah, that's, so that's such a good movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's. I call it the, the best little movie you never heard of. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it's nice that like over through like through the years, people have um, go like, I saw that. You know, that was really good. Like they were expecting it to be bad. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and then when they watched it, they really liked it. So um, that's that's always been satisfying through the years. But yeah, that that was my first job, and I was uh, desperately in love with it, and still have a very soft spot in my heart for uh that movie and i was um, originally hired to work on the lead male character danny but mm. it wasn't long before uh they moved me on over to sawyer uh the lead mm. female which um i was happy about because that's mm. that's i liked her and that's what i wanted to do I was, I was very specifically um uh, goal, a, a specific goal for me was to to work on uh, to animate the female characters. Mm -hmm. Did you get to do any Darla? I did not do any Darla. No, I, I strictly did um, uh, Sawyer and Danny, and uh, I think I did a little Tilly scene uh, mm -hmm. once, but she she was just sort of listening to Sawyer. <laughs> yeah, Sawyer's awesome. She was fun. Uh, that's that's really cool. Um, so w at which point did you kind of start, you know, trying out your own ideas and like what was some of the earlier projects that you remember kind of developing? Um, I was on uh, My Little Pony for a really long, or My Little Pony. See, this is what happens when I try to draw. The ponies are, yeah, and <laughs> the ponies are coming out. <laughs> um, I was on Powerpuff Girls uh, mm -hmm. and got... Uh, real excited at the at the possibility of um creating a show i had been in features for uh some time before i uh mm -hmm. moved to tv um and uh um you know as a as an animator in features i really only want i'm so embarrassed by these drawings by the way um <laughs> Dory, <laughs> me, so me too i can't draw oh with this i have never drawn a uh uh I've never drawn a pony in my life. I'm doing my best here. This is this is my nightmare. Um, uh, I worked. I was an animator on Cats of Dance, and then this movie called Quest for Camelot, and that wasn't the greatest experience, to be perfectly honest. And then mm. uh, Iron Giant, and then 2D animation was kind of falling away, and uh, everybody I knew was starting to learn CG, and I, I specifically made the decision that like I still wanted to draw. Um, right. So mm -hmm. I segued into storyboarding and luckily landed a job on the Powerpuff Girls. So um, as a storyboarder and as a writer, because um, that's how they did it. It was board driven, um, which was such a great learning um, uh, experience. But uh, while I was there working on it, you know, everybody who was on the Powerpuff crew, the Dexter's crew, the other shows that were being made at the time were all there, you know, behind the scenes developing and pitching their own shows. So I was like, ooh, I want to do one too. Um, <clears throat> I developed personally, like in my own time, a, a hand, a small handful of things that I pitched to Cartoon Network that didn't quite go mm. through. Um, but that that's, that's when I started... Um, thinking thinking a little bigger as a feature animator i just wanted to be uh, i wanted to work my way to being a lead i never thought about writing or story but once i moved to tv my my mindset switched mm -hmm. is it is it because you were like oh this is this is like an opportunity that you hadn't been um what's the word like it just wasn't never presented to you until you saw the people doing it kind of thing yeah, I mean, you know, working in feature, um, and I was working for kind of smaller studios, and, and I was one of the younger artists and one of the very few uh, females um, mm. <clears throat> in the animation department. Um, women tended to, to get um, pushed into cleanup, which I always thought mm -hmm. was a very unfortunate name for that title. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, 
you know, so nobody ever walked over to me and went, hey, you should do your own thing. For me, it was Mm. just kind of being surrounded by other people who were in the process of doing it themselves and, you know, taking the reins for myself. You know, behind the scenes, you know, by that time, um, Craig and I, um, Craig McCracken, my husband, the creator of the Powerpuff Girls, uh, Craig and I were already um, pretty like deep into our relationship. And I got a lot of encouragement from him. You know, I'd I'd throw Mm -hmm. ideas in his direction and he'd be like, you should pitch it, you should pitch it. Um, Which which gave me just a little bit, uh, just enough of the confidence I needed to to go forward and and go for it. But Cartoon Network at the time was also very like, hey, everybody pitch us your stuff. So, Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I just kind of went for it. But yeah, when nobody at any point ever said, um, until later in my career, and I had some significant credits behind me. Nobody, nobody really approached me to go, hey, you, right. you should do this. Yeah. Not at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, that's like, yeah, that's just, that's crazy when I think about like how the landscape was back then and that like, you know, like how did you, because you said you had like a lot of um, ideas that you were pitching. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, they not all of them went through uh, how did you deal with the nose and the like you know like picking yourself like back up from like a rejection because that's like really hard yeah yeah you know for me all of my rejections all of them all of them literally were we don't want to make shows about girls yeah. <laughs> girls don't ah. watch cartoons can you make it more for boys? Can you add boys? Can you do this? Mm -hmm, Especially mm -hmm. like way back then. And um, for me at that time, the rejection just made me mad. (laughs) (laughs) And that was my motivator to keep going was just all like- Spite is the best. Oh my God, (laughs) it was just like, that's wrong, that's bad and screw you. And I'm gonna gonna make it through somehow. and and I actually switched instead of trying to go, all right, I'll make something they want. I'll try to fashion it around their needs or taking something I was passionate about and turning it into something, frankly, that I wasn't passionate about. I switched gears. I took a couple years off and this was after Powerpuff, um, mm. Powerpuff movie. And then um, I was the producer and head of story and that's writing and storyboards on Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. Mm-hmm. So I left Foster's Home a little early and went, um, one of the things I was pitching at Cartoon Network that wasn't quite getting through was this, this uh, IP I have called Milky Way and the Galaxy Girls. Mm-hmm. And I just went, you know what? Everybody's telling me girls don't like animation. Nobody's going to tell me that girls don't like dolls. So I switched mm-hmm. my gears to trying to see what I could do, um, uh, getting my foot in the door in in the toy and branding business. Smart, yeah. Um, ran into a lot of challenges and obstacles I really wasn't expecting, but that pulled me back around into animation because I was pitching Galaxy Girls to Hasbro, and that oh, that led me to My Little Pony. Did you mean that, like, when you were pitching toys, were you were, were you still pitching it around a an animated show? Or were you pitching um re- like t- like toys like a toy brand i was trying to create it into a brand um mm. so toys and just generalized licensing and what i kept running into which was a big kind of frustrating surprise was people who make toys people who make make t-shirts people who make you know any any sort of other thing that you would license um apparel a lot of apparel would say, Mm -hmm. we love it and we want to do it, make a cartoon. And I was like, oh, I'm over here because I can't make cartoons. (laughs) Oh my God. Nobody wants these Uh... cartoons. (laughs) So I was trying to, I was, you know, part of creating a brand and and creating an intellectual property. I, I tried, I was trying to pitch it around as a show to, you know, simultaneous release with a tour line, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was really it was really tough because I hadn't been a creator or a showrunner at that time, and the mm-hmm. sorts of studios that supported toy lines um, were 
you know, kind of cheaper studios that made, you know, less quality stuff. And I mm-hmm. felt like I don't want my first uh, foray into making animation to be something that's kind of half rate and, you know, doesn't look really good. And also mm-hmm. for a bunch of people who aren't going to listen to me. Mm-hmm. Right. Is there any specific sort of red flags that you would kind of look and look out for when you're having these early conversations that would be like, oh, I don't think I want to deal with this studio or this executive or whatever. Is there anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the case of those particular studios, they were, um, you know, showing me that the, the other shows that they were making that were all IP based, all branding. Um, and they were like one guy almost seemed like he deserved it you know it's like i Mm. i make these other shows for dolls and you know you obviously our studio is the place to do it but i didn't particularly like those shows and they were all full of the kind of stereotyping of girls and girls interest that i was specifically trying to avoid with this property Mm. and um you know, a, a lot of it too is just when you're talking to people in conversations, are they giving you room to talk? Are they interrupting you? And, and that's tough. No, Sometimes you run into that. You're just all like, mm, they, they want this job, but they're, I can tell they think that they're better than me and I don't, I don't need to deal with that. Yeah. yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. That was me like, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's rough. It doesn't happen very often. It really doesn't, but like, I'm always okay. sort of testing the waters and asking questions, engaging how people respond. Boy, I was um, interviewing an art director once and I just couldn't believe how much he was interrupting me. Mm. <laughs> I was like, this is not a good interview tactic, dude. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. That's so, that's really, do you feel like, um, also, uh, because you said you were um, had a story on uh, Fosters, uh, d- were you doing the hiring process uh, there as well? And do you feel like that helped you uh, kind of come up with all of like uh, ways to interview like people in like higher positions as well later on? If that makes sense, I don't know if that. Yeah, makes sense. no, on Fosters. I didn't do a whole lot of interviews on Fosters, but uh, Craig and I um, reviewed samples together or separately from one another and then like came together and say, I like this person, I like this person, don't like this person, don't like this person. Craig Craig and I have a really great creative connection. Um, Mm -hmm. We we bounce, we volley ideas between the two of us very well. We we kind of understand what each other's talking about. You know, sometimes you're pitching something mm-hmm. to somebody and they're imagining something very different than what you think is coming out of your mouth. Oh um, my gosh, yes. <laughs> and that's but Craig and I have this great connection. So so for the most part, we tended to agree on, on uh, who who to bring on to the team. Um, interviewing that's wasn't great. a huge part of that at that time. It was it was mm-hmm. mostly reviewing uh, portfolios and um, uh, scripts and that sort of thing. <clears throat> Are there any uh, challenges that come with working with your significant other so closely? Yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I'm just just wondering, I mean, like my, my girlfriend is also like, we've worked on stuff before. Like she's very huge part of my creative journey and we have that same sort of synergy, you know, where we like understand each other's tastes, but like there's, there's always going to be weird little power dynamics, right? Like there's always going to be weird things that pop up Yeah. and like, I'm wondering how you guys navigate that. It, it, that kind of stuff didn't start happening a little until later. Um, at the beginning of our working relationship, we did, you know, they were, they were Craig shows. It was Powerpuff Girls. It was Foster's. And, um, I was, you know, I was his number two um we were quite comfortable with that um again because we had this really great creative connection but once i stepped away and ultimately got to show run my little pony um i started getting a little frustrated with being second banana Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. when i went back to work with him on wander over yonder um Mm -hmm. and you know uh wanted to be more wanted to stay being more of the person who guides the vision um, mm-hmm. so it didn't necessarily cause any problems, but it was just a change in our, uh, you know, professional relationship that we had to navigate. But 
doesn't, I can't say it really causes any problems. For a while, you know, I, I remember noting that all we ever did was talk about work ever, but right. that was fine. <laughs> well, you, you, you love what you do, right? Yeah, so. yeah. We were, we were working on the same things. We were really passionate about it. We wanted to solve problems, come up with new ideas. I mean, it was fun for us. So that really wasn't, I would never say that was a problem. Um, yeah. But yeah, there, there was a point where I was like, I had an idea and he might have had a slightly different idea. And I found myself having to adjust for him and going like, this doesn't feel as good as it used to. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. You know, it's like, I think I'm going to go back to trying to find my own thing to do. I think it's like, it's, it's a common experience to like, I have something I'm like kind of worried about as I'm like, you know, I'm moving up to like direct, like episode director and stuff. And I'm like, oh, am I going to be able to be a storyboard artist again? Because I'm the one giving the notes now. And like, it means like if I like, do storyboards again I, I will have to do the notes <laughs> yeah yeah and and yeah for me I'm worried about doing storyboarding again because it's just it's grown so much and become more, so much more complicated since the last time I did it that I'm like I don't even know mm. if I can do it anymore <laughs> at least not up to the current standards yeah it's true that like I, I saw that you were tweeting about like storyboards and kind of like how it changed and everything and it's kind of it's really interesting for me to kind of like follow that conversation because I I've that's all I've known like when I when I started um working in animation 10 years ago Storyboard Pro was already like uh pretty much the industry standard so uh because of that new tool we now are making boards that are very close to animation sometimes mm -hmm. which is like ah I hate on. it I hate <laughs> it I hate it I think it's unfair to ask people to do it but I personally feel like it causes production problems I am always telling my storyboard artists stop animating it's yeah. it's because when we take it into edit we pull so many drawings out and it's like right. it's torture to yeah. watch like storyboard artists are tortured right now um mm -hmm. and it's torture for me to watch them being tortured um and then they're doing i feel like three times as much as they need to and i totally. know they're exhausted and they're working on weekends and they're begging for more time and I'm always like, please stop animating your boards. It's also such a burden on the editors because they have to import every single one of those drawings and they have to time mm -hmm. every single one of those drawings. Then me and my supervising directors come in and pull out like a third of them. Um, so more work for the editor and then wasted work on the storyboarders. Uh, uh, Craig is of the same opinion. Mm -hmm. It, I actually feel like it causes problems. It, it exhausts the storyboarders and it burdens the editor and it, it, it burdens the director having to like, you know, we want to be managing the story and managing the timing, not looking at like animation and deciding frames to pull. It's, it's, um, I hate it. That's my bottom I think line. it's yeah. really interesting too, because <laughs> you and um, you come from shows like Powerpuff Girls, mm -hmm. uh, Fosters and all these shows I've always like, it's funny because when I was working in France, those were the shows that we were looking at uh, because like when I started my career in France, those were the shows that we were looking at as like examples mm -hmm. uh, of what we needed to do. Cause in France, the, the schedules were so short and yeah. the money is, the budgets are so much uh, smaller that I don't, there's no way that there's <laughs> like, even if you wanted to animate yeah. your board, there's just no way. So you have right. to be smart. And I feel like, wonder was like i i would be watching these episodes and i'm and i'm like this is so smart this is like the smartest boards i've ever seen because mm -hmm. it's just like every drawing counts and i'm like is that something um we had chris mitchell's on the podcast like a couple episodes ago and i remember him saying something like working at cartoon networks it, it, um in in the 90s was kind of like figuring out all of these like really um like smart design tricks yeah. and do you feel like you were part of like that on the board side as well like the smart board choices yeah the, the biggest education for me was when we started doing fosters um we were doing it in flash and right. we were working with flash rigs for the first time and flash especially at the time was super duper 
duper duper limited and mm -hmm. even on powerpuff girls and i was never on dexter's lab but i understood this was the philosophy on dexter lab was we don't have a lot of money so we need mm -hmm. to figure out how to make this as good as we can with what we have i remember this was a million years before i met craig i remember watching it on tv and just going and it was side by side with a new version of johnny quest where they were trying to make it look really like cool and these right. were the, these really cool, that. great examples of like these people kept it simple and it's great and it's fun to watch. And then mm -hmm. Johnny Quest, these people were trying to make it super cool and really complicated. And it might have worked if they had more money and more time. But because it they didn't, it actually looked really it, it came through very poorly. Um, mm -hmm. and that was a big lesson for me and and what I'm trying always to to say and push in TV and I yet to completely figure it out because I still do too much and I still make it too complicated. Mm -hmm. I always say that like you either look you're making us make it fast you're not make, giving us a lot of money this is TV it's not feature film you get a choice you get a re you either get a really cute fun tricked out Volkswagen bug that's just mm -hmm. really just a nice paint job and a few little like fun little modern functions on the inside or you get a really janky shitty Cadillac that's falling apart and doesn't really yeah. work like so which way mm -hmm. are we gonna go are we gonna yeah, go with got really a speed car bug or, or crap <laughs> <Cadillac>? yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah both are cars yeah but <laughs> you technically got a car right you, yeah. and like you, a good cheap one a really great fun cheap one or like a really you know cheap one that's mm -hmm. trying so hard to be look expensive that it just looks terrible but on fosters you know having to learn to storyboard within the limitations of flash was a huge thing for me and um even though even though we have moved beyond flash in animation um, people who still do hand-drawn stuff overseas and then you know i personally love harmony shows bringing in yeah. those flash tricks still mm. um is still viable so like you can save your fancy 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 shots for the really critical moments as long as you're drawing efficiently um, and staging things efficient, efficiently in the calmer moments and the, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. flash tricks like um, characters can't turn around on the screen. So little tricks like you cut away from them before they left the scene and then you cut to the next scene with them entering in a profile, Interesting, you know, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, uh, cutting away and then having characters in new places is like a really good trick. Um, it saves mm -hmm. travel time because that'll eat up the time in your show. But also, yep. um, you know, it's, it's, we, we cut away. We didn't see them walk. Now they're in a new place. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Walk cycles are the worst. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, that's, that is so expensive. Yeah. I feel like um, if you were to, if you're staffing a show and you're looking for a supervising director or like, or, or episode directors that are, that are familiar with these, um, like that way of thinking, do you feel like it's harder now? Do you feel like yes. it's always been hard? Hard to find people who think that way? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is. I, I wish so badly, and I don't know, maybe I should do it, that somebody out there needs to have a class on how to storyboard Please. for TV, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, uh, to just uh, to think efficiently, to not, um, I think Shannon Tyndall said something on Twitter once that I loved is that, because apparently he is in agreement, um, that <laughs> he would rather have storyboarders spending their time thinking about their shots and how they're cinematically mm -hmm. relevant, relevant um, mm -hmm. and um, efficient for all the people who are coming behind, uh, coming after you. Um, mm -hmm. He'd rather people thinking about uh, using their time to think about awesome shots than animating stuff in a lousy shot. You know, right. and yep. um, mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with that as well. Yeah. And a lot of you know us old schoolers um, learned how to do it. I, I worked with a few people. I could not stop them from animating and I could not stop them from storyboarding in a feature capacity. And I was like, you know, mm -hmm. they just need to spend a year on a show like SpongeBob 
so they can mm -hmm. learn the tricks and learn how to be efficient and learn just how much you actually do have to draw for your animators who are coming behind me and it's their job to animate. And I've just always been like, you just, you just need a training period on a show that's designed to be simply yeah. storyboarded. Um, yeah, because I think um, for some reason, anybody right now under 35, I feel like over storyboards and it's just because they don't, they don't know how. Well, and you know, yeah. it's kind of interesting because I, I have been, because coming from friends where like, that's kind of like, there's just no way around it. That's kind of how I learned to storyboard. And actually, I think that's the reason why I landed my first American job on the Loud House was because the Loud House <laughs> was in the style that was what french cartoons are in right now. yeah yeah <laughs> um and but then moving out of the loud house i realized i started going on to these hand-drawn shows and then i was like holy moly well i guess i do have to to animate um a lot more so um it's kind of interesting because i wonder i this is a kind of a crazy question but i've also noticed that when i was working in in france i could talk to the surprising director and or the showrunner about budget and they knew what the budget was yeah. roughly but when i try to talk to the uh, showrunners here in la most of the time they don't have a clear idea what the budget is yeah like the there's not that communication. Has no. this always been your experience yes. or is that a new thing? No, <laughs> it's always been my experience and it drives me nuts. Um, That's crazy. I, I, That's I crazy. don't know why they don't tell us the budget. They'll say it's low budget, mm -hmm. mid budget, high budget. But one time I was told like this, we want this show to be high budget. And then I was like, all right, I'm excited. Let's, let's make this really slick. And then halfway through, they're like, why did you make it so hard? Um, <laughs> you know, lower your standards. It's too, it's too difficult. Like you, but you never told me how much each episode is going to be and how much that, um, you know, I want to be able to design a show around our budget. Um, and, and right. what that really means. I mean, I think that's the other part of it is directors and showrunners, uh, especially newer showrunners dive into it all with the creativity, you know, mm -hmm. the, the drawings, mm -hmm. the stories, you know, we, and that's what we love and that's what we really want to focus on. So sometimes people don't even have an understanding of what the budget really means. Like on one of my projects, you know, we, we had already been through development. The, the show had, you know, it didn't have a huge cast, um, but it had a, a sizable cast. And, you know, when we started to staff up, so they were like, okay, we have enough money in the budget for three character designers. And I was like, what? Three? <laughs> if I knew I only got three character designers, I would have made a lot of other decisions. I would have made completely different creative decisions, but we're already like eight scripts in and we can't go yeah. back. And you're yeah. telling me I only get three character designers? I really needed to know that sooner. So yeah, yeah it's so crazy. Yeah. I feel like isn't that I how does it um because I'm you know back to the car analogy I'm guessing someone who's at the head of a car manufacturing pipeline knows how much money they're dealing right. with, right? Yeah, I, the the other analogy I have is um you're building a home, right? And and yeah. mm -hmm. you know the way animation works is the studios are all like you come up with a show idea on your own time and for free and then you pitch it to us and if we like it we'll change all of it um <laughs> and, sure um, is how it is, huh? um but that's like going hey I want to build a house, you guys. Every architect in town, send me your favorite blueprints and I will pick the one I like the most. And then, then I will tell you what my budget is, how many bedrooms I want, how many bathrooms oh, I want, how many stories I want. Then we'll tell you the the guidelines that our county has. And when you say it out loud like that, yeah, yeah. right. And then then you know, and and what sort of soil it's on. Like, okay, now that I have your blueprint that you love and you work so hard on, now I'm going to give you your limitations and make you change it while you're in the process of building the house. So like, <laughs> you know, that's like, that's, it's really, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's so validating for me to hear all of that because coming from once again, like, um, a, an environment where I could 
talk budget um you know like you know just as a as a newcomer in animation asking questions like i could be like so how much are you spending on this or that da, 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 and getting answers going to this environment where everything feels really opaque um I've, it, it it feels it's it's really surprising and um someone kind of mentioned the um, analogy like you're flying the the plane as you're building it yeah. and i'm like this is so scary no it's, like, it's, it's, it's terrible. imagine literally literally being on the plane that's being built yeah. while, and i'm like how do you deal with the stress of that because that that is so stressful i don't i don't <laughs> deal with it well <laughs> it's just it gets to a point where you really feel like uh you know that old uh mm -hmm. um uh, I love Lucy episode with the with the yes. with the chocolates on the yeah. on the conveyor Piling belt. up more and more. There just gets to be a point where you're just shoving the chocolates down and just mm -hmm. shoving them in your mouth and down the front of your shirt and under your hat and you're like this. I know this isn't going to work, but there's no right. time to step backwards mm -hmm. and repair. Um, Here's the other thing I say. I'm full of like analogies and sayings. Um, the other thing oh, I great. say is you you prepare or you repair. And I'm always Ooh, going to stories uh, studios, going like, give us time to set it up before you put us on the track. You know, mm -hmm. we should have all of our characters designed. We should have all our turns and our assets. Every director should have their first episode should be longer than the goal that we want our episodes to be so you know every storyboarder if, if you're if you're asking storyboarders to do 22 minute episodes in six weeks well their first episode they get eight weeks they get 10 weeks would be nice to like mm -hmm. to like be able to to build up the show and and recover from missteps that always happen in the beginning but more often than not you're actually starting behind so they expect you to wow. yeah that's painful um and um, so like you have to build it and f um, you know, exactly during the time that you should be going slow, you're going too fast. Um, and that, that can be, I'm sounding so negative. I don't want to like discourage I think every you're sounding realistic. single person who wants to make shows is not going to want to now. <laughs> I do, no. I do want to, I'm so glad that you're talking about all this though, because we don't, we haven't really talked about any of all this on the show yet. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like, so those, are, those are things that you want to um, start, you know, thinking about as like an up and coming artist. Yeah. And even for artists out there who are making animation independently, like I, I was uh, mentoring um, a young board artist who's helping on a indie project where they're putting together a team and everything. So it's kind of interesting because they're also dealing with the budget that they got through mm -hmm. Kickstarter and all that. So there's like analogies to be drawn. Um, but um, I wanted to say like, it's, it's really interesting because it also shows the reality of being a showrunner and it's not just creativity because um sometimes like you know i um if you're only creativity then like you said you might end up with the uh, cadillac that's like falling apart <laughs> uh if it's just like uh, uh, art um and i even remember on, uh, there was like a show that i was on uh, where the line producer and the showrunner were arguing about like, no, this is art. And then the line producer was like, but it's TV. It's got to be made. <laughs> so it's kind of yeah, like... <laughs> totally different pipeline. Yeah, yeah, very different. Uh, so I do feel like that very nitty gritty aspect of it, it's so important to hear. And I don't think it's all negative. It's just that it has to be thought about. It's realistic. And, yeah, realistically, you know. So I think, great. yeah, if I, if I may add something to that, like I, I come from the flash animation world as well. Like I started flash animating very early in my life. And like, um, I think that that might not be a great path for everybody coming in, but I do think it's incredibly helpful because when you like start making your own shorts, you are working within the scope of your own ability. And that. I think has really helped me going forward. And I think it would help a lot of people to like try making your own things first before you mm. jump into pitching or working on another show because you get such a better understanding of how long things take. Yeah. It's hard to estimate budget when it's all you, but you can definitely get a feel for how, you know, how hard things are. And so it's like you pick up all the skills that Lauren mentioned, like the storyboarding and the staging that are more efficient and more, um, you know, doable but like even i've noticed 
even when going into pitch, like the more producible a thing is, the more likely it is that they might pay attention to because if yeah. and producible means cheap, like that, like that's what it means. Mm-hmm. See, I don't but, know if but, that's entirely always true though, because okay, I yeah. will go in sometimes. So for instance, on superhero girls, my first pass on the characters I felt was a much more forgiving uh, characterizations. They were cartoonier, mm-hmm. not, not hugely cartoonier, but they were cartoonier with simpler shapes that um, would have um, more uh, opportunities for squash and stretch. And then the toy people came in and said, we want to make dolls out of these, so they have to be pretty. Right. They have to be pretty, 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 pretty. And I wanted diversity, and I wanted body shape diversity, and I also personally want to go, you know, why does every female protagonist in animation have to be pretty? Um, right. In fact, that was a specific goal I had on Toil and Trouble. I wanted the main female character, Toil, to be awkward um, and mm-hmm. kind of not pretty, actually. Um, so on Superhero Girls, I had to redesign the characters, and we didn't really have time to do that. Um, and to get the toy team to approve them, they became much more complicated designs, um, much more difficult for other designers to draw on model, like the cartoonier, bubblier ones. I think more people could have hit the style. Um, mm-hmm. And it caused um, a lot of challenges that I think could have been avoided. And so I do, I have seen a lot of instances when you do try to be efficient, mm-hmm. they a lot of executives i think are so blinded by you know the beauty of feature films that they they push you in that direction and then you don't always get the support or the time or the money that you need to actually make it the way that that they really want to see it so i mean and i don't want to say that always happens it it doesn't but you know the i i the, my bigger, more epic, more exciting ideas are the ones that tend to get through more often, but then they're really okay. hard to produce. Um, yeah. 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 Interesting. That's great to hear. Yeah. I think that, yeah, it seems like you just kind of have to pivot. <laughs> you just have to kind of be ready to pivot, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you gotta and you have to, to learn to your studio. You have to learn your executive and, you know, what they do and don't like and how they run things and what does and doesn't get approved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, I feel like I'm being so horribly negative. <laughs> I don't think that's negative, though. I, think I don't it's think it's just, negative. Yeah, because I think for me also, it's something like, you know, when people are like, oh, you should, um, you know, you should do your research and know what the studio wants. And it kind of never really clicked for me until I worked uh, a couple of years at each different studio. And I think it's so true. There's like, depending on who's in charge, like the president or VP of animation at the studio, like, that person will kind of define a style and learning yeah. what they like is so important and like doing the research on like uh yeah so i think it's and, and i mean it, it makes sense right like you know uh people get hired as like president of like an animation branch to take the company in a certain direction so mm-hmm. yeah it kind of makes sense yeah to look it up i think that's like how did you i kind of like talking about all that um you know like studio business like how did you kind of learn how to navigate politics because that's something that i'm kind of like really curious about because as artists we don't learn it at school yep. no um <laughs> i really wish i was better at it <laughs> i'm still learning that one so someone told me once that i i'm good at leading uh this is going to sound bad but i'm good at leading down so I'm good at uh, working with the people that it's my job to guide and direct, mm-hmm. but I'm not as good. Um, one thing I, I still struggle with is um, uh, leading up um, mm-hmm. and uh, talking to and um, trying to get uh, people above me to bend to my will. Um, <laughs> or... Um, so yeah it's it's um and that's and part of that is politics they don't teach you that in school and i don't think it's naturally a part of a lot of um artists brains to Mm -hmm. um think that way um 
Yeah. And sometimes that, that more than like the work, um, I love the work. I love the art. I love the creativity of it, but the, the politics is, is one of the parts I, I really wish I didn't have to deal with as much. Yeah. It's, it's a really tough part. It, it yeah. has to, it involves a lot of psychology and a lot of like weird, um, almost mind games at times in my experience. Yeah. It's like, cause the execs love to give you one thing, but mean another. And, um, the note behind the note, you, yeah. you learn all these things, you know, and it's like, but how do you even teach somebody that? I don't know. Yeah. It's kind of what I was wondering. I was going to like, I was, I'm sometimes I'm thinking like, should I take business classes? Like how, you know, I was, I've always wondered, and I kind of asked this question to everyone, like, how do you ever kind of um, think about, I don't know, um, like bettering your skills at it, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I took a, um, a leadership course once, um, and like, which sounds so like generic and silly, but it, that really helped me, but I tried to take a negotiation course. Oh, wow. oh yeah. And part of the course was to like fake negotiate with strangers. And I was like, mm -hmm. I, I can't do that. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I was like, that's, that's going to stress me out way too much. And yeah. I think that kind of defines my personal <laughs> problems with uh, dealing with politics is just like this horrible um uh, uh, uh avoidance of of conflict um so yeah i think yeah. that's definitely i wish i could give people advice on that but that's that's something i'm still trying to figure out and i and i think too um you know the the differences between a, a woman navigating politics versus a man navigating politics because you know at, at least me I, i'm always worried i always have to kind of edit what i'm going to say before i do because i don't mm -hmm. want to sound like well, i don't want to sound like bitch and i don't want to sound mm -hmm. because as soon as somebody starts thinking of you in that direction you're gonna lose yeah. but you know mm -hmm. then i see lots of male creators who just scream at people all the time and mm -hmm. it's all okay you know and if i'm just a little bit firm all of a sudden i'm yeah. too demanding i'm a bitch i'm a control freak i've been called all those things yeah that's so unfortunate yeah i mean i totally understand that like i obviously i haven't been in positions that are like as high up as you were but like as a as a director sometimes like having you to like you know there, you face a problem that's like a, like maybe like a writing problem or maybe something like that's kind of like higher up the food chain and you're like all right i gotta have to I'm going to have to talk about it and it's probably not going to go my way and hopefully someone's going to listen to me, but it's like, just like these discussions are so tough because like you said, there's just so many things you can't say and you can't, I don't know, I've found that I can't, I can't be too honest or frontal, which is very hard. Um, uh, and I, yeah, that's why I was like wondering anything like yeah business. i'm still figuring it out and again it, it really depends on who you're working with um, my favorite executives to work with and i've had the pleasure of working with them are people who are happy to be in animation um mm -hmm. the ones that are a little harder are the people who are, wish they were in live action um mm -hmm. and then the people who wish they were the writers or they were the creators mm -hmm. um that's mm -hmm. that's a little hard to deal with sometimes too um, but I've, I've worked with a bunch of execs who are um, happy to give artists um, a lot of space, um, happy to and happy to be in animation, you know, animation fans. When I walk into an executive's room and it's full of toys, I'm like, yay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All That's right. Good to see. This will be a lot easier. Like this will this will be more fun, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. So there, that's that's a positive thing I said. <laughs> I think it's all positive. I think that it's it's important to hear this stuff. I think that um, if it's you know, I think to a lot of animation fans, they they focus in on the the art of it, which is great, mm -hmm. and like I, I love to see that energy. But at a certain point, you have to face reality that like it is a business and it is hard. And if you're the kind of person who wants to get into telling your own stories and and you know trying to sort of work your way up that ladder like 
you are going to be punished. <laughs> you are going to face <laughs> you're going to face some harsh realities and and learn all about the wonders of capitalism. And so like it's it's important to hear these things, I think. I think it's very valuable. Yeah. Um so something that we like to ask our guests is uh about creative block and how they deal with it and what it feels like to them. So we'd love to hear your thoughts. Um yeah, I have a couple of ways that I deal with it. Um when I'm working you know, when when you're feeling a little blank, um, and but I'm working on a project that I'm being paid for, <laughs> right? Um, and you've got a deadline and you got to do it. I, I really just I hunker down and I do it. Um, usually for me, about twenty or thirty minutes in, I, I find a flow. Um, but I always have to remind myself: if it's bad, I can erase it. If it's bad, mm. I can delete it. Um, Sometimes I'll, if I'm writing, I'll suffer through a scene that's like really not working for me. Um, but I'm like, just, just get through it. Put in placeholders, you know, asterisks. Mm. Generally, this thing happens here. I'll figure it out later. Or I know the character needs to say something here, but I can't think of anything funny right now. I'll go do it later. Just so I'm constantly moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's a case where I just have to really just just force myself and wait until the, the more of a flow kicks in. When I'm working on my own, um, I'm definitely a little slower um, because I do wait for the inspiration to come to me. Um, and, and I do, sometimes I feel like I'm procrastinating, but sometimes I feel like you really need that because sometimes as long as you're rested and you're happy and your home life is is stable, you you come up with ideas in the shower or mm -hmm. driving your kid to school or, um, you know, going for a walk. So that's, I think, when I come up with my most creative ideas is when I'm in that slower space and I let them come to me as long as I'm always thinking about it. Um, then then uh, then good stuff comes out. So so that's how, you know, those are those are my two ways of 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 doing it. That's that's successful for me. If that helps. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's great. great. That's really great. Yeah. The shower thing is a recurring thing. Is really <laughs> what is it about the shower? I mean, seriously, <laughs> I, have, I have my thing because it works for me, too. It's a it's because it's like monotonous and there's white noise and you're isolated and it's at the end of the day well for me it's at the end of the day but like it just feels like it's like a time to rest right for my brain my body like it's yeah yeah and you forget about like all the other naggy things you have to do oh i gotta make that phone call i gotta it, uh, answer that email it's mm -hmm. like somehow some little escape chamber <laughs> Where, mm -hmm. like and you're cozy and warm and you know <laughs> relaxed and you know a little little bit of stress free and um you know that's that's my favorite like I said that's when I come up with my best ideas um another thing I like to do that's um this isn't necessarily when I have creative block but when I'm starting a new project my my favorite part of working in animation is is development i i, I mm -hmm. love coming up with the new ideas i love putting puzzle pieces together creating characters creating character dynamics if you have a group mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and um i do that by drawing and i have little sketchbooks where one side of the sketchbook is blank for drawing the other side of the sketchbook is lined for notes and that's mm. when I let my mind, I can really let my mind wander. So while I'm drawing a character, I can't help but also think about who they are, you know? Um, mm. And I think that comes from a childhood of drawing on my um, class assignments. <laughs> so mm -hmm. instead of doing math, I'm drawing on the side and um, coming up again with those, those ideas, that's when they start all flowing and coming naturally to me. And you start putting the puzzle pieces together and suddenly you have somebody in front of you that you really like, you really like, you like the way they look, you like who they are. Um, and I don't necessarily do that when I'm blocked, but that's, that's when I'm coming up with new ideas. I just start to sketch. And then I have these sketchbooks for everything that I've created that is just, um, drawings and notes and drawings and notes and drawing and notes all, all over the place um and that's that's that that part is the most fun for me 
Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, we got some questions on Twitter that we'd love to ask you. Uh, the first one that I'll ask is from at Flippy Super. And the question is, could you ever see yourself heading an independent project? I guess separate from the studio system. Um, if like there, through the years, people have asked uh, Craig and I both if we wanted to start our own studio. Mm. And we've always been no, <laughs> um, <laughs> because I don't want to deal with the business part right. of it. And mm. I've seen, you know, you see really creative, really talented people trying to do something like that. And all of a sudden they're not drawing anymore and they're not writing anymore. They're just, they're just managing. And that's the fun part for me. So I wouldn't want to do mm. that. But right now, you know, to be a little overly honest, a little TMI, um, you know, a, a lot of you may or may not know that I had a, a kind of a disappointing um, experience at Netflix. Um, mm -hmm. I had this show called Toil and Trouble. Um, we were already into production. We had a crew of 50 people and uh, Netflix decided to just cancel the whole thing. Um, that was really disappointing. And, um, and the, the industry is a little bit, they're going through a strange phase right now. And it always goes in cycles, mm -hmm. but we're mm -hmm. in a not necessarily greater driven cycle right now. So I'm, I'm a little sick of the studios right now and, and feel like I need mm -hmm. a break. So mm -hmm. it's not so much that I'm doing an independent project, but I am working um, with more independent production companies. Um, outside of the studio system um where you know if, if you it, i'm helping them sometimes either create a bible or work your way towards making a pilot and then you take it to a studio and go this is what it is do you want it without their too much of their interference so that that's the direction i'm heading towards at the moment i like working for studios but you know right now everything is they just want intellectual properties um yeah and uh, the, the six to 11 um, demographic does not seem like something studios want to shoot for right now, which is where I've always lived. Um, mm. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so it isn't so much that I'm doing something independently, um, although I did start writing a book. <laughs> oh, cool. uh, um, uh, but that, that's, that's, I started writing a book and then that was my project at, at Netflix. So I don't know if I'm going to go back and write it as a book or not. Um, but uh, yeah, that's about as independent as I, I want to be at least right now. I also uh, talking about independent projects. I saw that you did designs for an indie video game. How was that? Oh yeah. Well, that, that's been fascinating because that's been going on for a really long time. Um, I really got to give a shout out to the team at, you know, the, the, the development team. We called ourselves main six because the whole project started out of a, my little pony fan project. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who have been keeping it going. Um, they're the ones who've been keeping it alive um, for over a decade now and creating tons and tons of concepts based um, and content, I mean, based around these characters and worlds that um, I, I created for them. Um, so really, it's like while I'm bringing a lot of creative work to the table and ideas and designs, um, they're they're the they're the ones who are like literally right. making it and kudos mm -hmm. to them i i don't know how they've they've kept it going this um whole time and i'm i'm very grateful that they have that is so cool that is so cool <laughs> yeah, that's awesome yeah we want to start doing some episodes with um video gaming people too because it's like it's such a huge industry and um there's such a like there's so much potential, untapped potential, and such a booming indie scene. It's like, it feels like what I wish animation had more of as well. Like mm -hmm. just the the ability to just generate stuff and have it be successful. And like indie gaming right now is doing such a good job of of like fostering that and mm -hmm. letting people make a, a livable income on just making the game they want to make. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's not the money's not as good as animation in games. Um, in from my understanding, I, I have very uh, limited knowledge. Yeah, 
It, it depends. I'm actually working in mobile games right now because I needed a break from TV because of everything you just said <laughs> in the yeah, last hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, and so I, that's kind of where I started my career and that's where I am right now. But it's, it's paying well. It's not, it's not like a fulfilling job on a spiritual level. Yeah. But um, it keeps me sane. They, they value, at least in my studio, not, definitely not all gaming studios are like this. But at least in my current job, they value work-life balance quite a bit. Oh, that's and nice. It's great. And it's because there's so much competition that they have to. You right, know? And right. I think that's that's where I wish I wish animation would do that and realize that like if you're constantly burning through artists and, and everyone, like it's gonna everyone's gonna burn out. You're gonna get worse work. It's gonna eventually it's gonna hurt the bottom line, right? Like yeah. it's not that's not sustainable. Yeah. It's nice um, to hear somebody's really doing it and it's not just lip service. Uh yeah, I am I'm trying to i'm absorbing a lot of lessons from this job that i'm at i probably won't stay here forever but i'm definitely like i'm learning a lot that i want to bring back to tv if when i come back because it's it's and i'm seeing my friends struggling you know with all these netflix cancellations and layoffs and everything and it's like this it doesn't I was have just to there. be like this. <laughs> this yeah a monday oh man yeah. Insane, yeah, insane. It's, but, it's so painful. Yeah. It's, bad. <laughs> it's really bad, yeah. and it's it doesn't have to be like this. And we know there's just as much money in in TV. Like we know there's tons of money in TV. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question of money. It's just where is that money going? Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. like that's the real problem. Um, yeah, I'm like we. We, nobody has there's no bonuses you know like i've i there, i'm like up for a bonus at the end of the year and I'm, I'm like wait what i can get money for like just doing a year's worth of work like what the fuck is this shit yeah like, so well, it depends I, so in feature they do have bonuses like i oh, have do. Okay. a lot of friends who work at uh the the french illumination studio so the where they actually do the animation illumination here in la they do more of like the development and more of like the meetings and everything um, but yeah, in like a lot of my friends who were animators there, like they would often stay because the bonuses are really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's depending great. Depending on how well, but that's also the thing. It's like the business model, right? It's like a theatrical release. You, you're going to see how well the movie does. Whereas if you're doing like a direct to streaming, well, how can they quantify how well your content does? Cause it's just subscription based. Mm -hmm. It's not like people buying yeah, like well, a, like a, a unit, you know what I'm saying? It's true. Like, but there's viewership numbers, right? And we know that Netflix doesn't like to share theirs. And so that that creates an unbalanced relationship because we don't know, we don't know what's doing well. Like we don't even know yeah. like what, what to push for. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Point is, is that I, it definitely could be way better. There's industries and at, at least specific studios that are, are in the gaming space that try and uh, maybe succeed. And so like, I think if, if they want to keep people happy, they, the studios have to figure something happy out. Happy people do better work. It's so happy do better work. it's so just obvious, and sometimes it's, I just yeah. can't believe that people, you know, don't realize that. It's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I could go on about it, but I don't want to talk about how great my job is right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's not helpful. To it anyone. doesn't work with the um, theme of my show. Or <laughs> no, it, yeah. It is. <laughs> Negativity. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, I I think that uh, I think what you've said is is needs to be heard because not enough people talk about it. I think a lot of us, you know, and I, I a lot of people that were jumping off of shows, not jumping off of, getting booted off of their shows mm -hmm. um, at uh, Netflix or other studios at this point. Um, I, I see a lot of people being afraid to say like what show was canceled, what was you know what went down, and it's like you don't know them anything anymore. Like you're fired. Like, I wish right, more people right. were, were open about that. Right. Well, it depends because it's like if you're working for this, like, if you're working for the, the studio that owns the IP, like, you know, if it's direct, you know, and there's no co-production, mm -hmm. then it's fine. Because, like, what are you, you know, what's going to happen? There is still the thing, though, that you imagine your project got canceled. You, If you want to get it back uh you there's still some negotiations there right oh i don't mean create like show running like that's a totally different thing right. I, like i mean people that are working like boards or design you know and and they won't 
they I, maybe it's like an NDA thing sometimes, but yeah. I've seen it happen where it's it's shows that have been announced and and they don't want to say what it was, and it's like why why you're just helping them, you're helping them cover their tracks. I, I don't know, it's just a... yeah. If you have an NDA, there's nothing you can do much about it. Sure. If that's like you know, that's it. You're not allowed to talk about it. You're not allowed to. You have signed something. You can't show it. But yeah, right. it is it is disappointing. Um, you can't show your we worked really hard on something you can't share mm -hmm. it you can't show it you can only show it to professionals um and uh it, again it's just it's 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 discouraging it's discouraging yeah there's a lot of like hush hush stuff that happens in animation yeah and it, it makes it so that it's hard to get a realistic picture of what's happening to the people that are either trying to get in or or have you know are just now getting it and like it 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 helps to to be vocal about all the 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 problems i think mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um uh, from a question from at cached art in retrospect what do you think it was about friendship is magic that captivated so many people and are you happy about the legacy that it has and what you contributed from your own vision to make it special um i think that it got uh the attention that it did and the fan base that grew around it because it just surprised people um, you know, my little pony before, you know, um, I got to take a stab at it. It was my favorite toy when I was a kid. Um, but I hated the show. Um, I was like, I liked the way that I played with the characters more than I liked the show. Um, and I remember once, um, after I was an adult, uh, you know, around the time I was, um, working on Foster's. Strawberry, they did a reboot of Strawberry Shortcake and I watched an episode of it just out of curiosity and I remember going not one single person who worked on this cared about it. So I think that, um, you know, there was a stigma and I think there still is against um, things that are for girls, um, especially if they're toy based, especially if they're cute little ponies with pictures on their butts. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, My Little Pony was almost kind of symbolic of that, like lame stuff for girls. So I think people tuned in. There was an article on Cartoon Brew that it was called The Death of Creator Driven Animation. And it was about oh boy. me and oh. Rob Renzetti selling out to make My Little Pony. Oh, boy. And oh, my God. Oh, Cartoon Brew. Uh, oh <laughs> The, the writer had never seen the show, but was talking about how bad he expected it to be. And I think that was like the general feeling that people have about, you know, little girl shows like My Little Pony or Strawberry Shortcake or, you know, now there's stuff like, you know, True in the Rainbow Kingdom or a lot of stuff my daughter loves to watch. She's six. And so people, I think, tuned in to hate watch it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And just like laugh at it and talk about how stupid it was. I kind of saw it unfold a little bit. And then all of a sudden people were saying, dudes, I, I actually kind of like it. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. They were like, this is going to be so dumb. And then they watch it and they're like, I actually really like this. So I think that the surprise of it, not totally sucking got people mm -hmm. like, like made people start getting interested in it. Like, dude, you guys like these, guess what my little pony is good like what what are you talking about and then they go watch it and go holy crap it is good i love rarity um, i yeah. think that's so interesting that you say that because i remember that article i i don't remember the words i just remember seeing it was on youtube it was you had the first episode mm -hmm. right the two-parter was on youtube and i was like this is crazy that we get to watch the first uh the whole two first episodes on youtube I was like, because I was like, oh, now I want to watch more of it because I had this little. It's pretty taste. common now too. That's like that was, I think, pretty groundbreaking. And I think but, that was another big part of it was people like it was on the hub, which was a cable channel most people didn't have or even knew about because it was new, um, and people were ripping it and put it on YouTube. And Hasbro and the hub didn't stop anybody. And I'll mm -hmm. always wonder if they did that on purpose or if they just didn't know. <laughs> But I think that was part of how it spread as well. So there was this surprise that something everybody expected to be so stupid wasn't stupid. And then they could actually access it and share it with people and show it to people. And, and that, that spread the word on it too. But I think, I think it was, it, I think it was that surprise that really was the initially ignited all of it, but that, that's just my theory. Other, other people might have other theories, especially, you know, 
uh, bronies themselves uh, sure. might have more of an opinion about like why why it got so big. I also think there was a community that lived behind it, uh, that grew behind it, that they just were like, you know, hey, you like it? I like it too. Let's be friends. Um, when I go right. to conventions, I'm always just a little shocked and happy to see people um, who our friends online meet at conventions and get to see each other in person for the first time. Yeah. Um, that, that makes me really happy. I've met people who met and got married through the fandom, mm -hmm. had kids, you know, people who felt like they did, had a hard time making friends, finding people they could connect to. And that's like part of the question was like, how do you feel about the legacy? And, and that's something that I'm really proud of. Um, you know, these, these people who, um, you know, the, the people who found each other, um, through this fandom is, um, and found people who could accept them and, and like them if, if they had, you know, difficulty in their own homes and own towns like that, that's, I'm super duper duper proud of. And I'm also proud of like have pr pr creating an example of something that's for girls that boys can and will watch too. Um, and, and bucking that original stereotype. I, I hope it sticks because it's, it, it's still there it that that feeling of like you know it fits for girls it must be stupid it's still there but at least we have like shows like powerpuff girls and and my little pony and um other you know now owl house and amphibia that and mm -hmm. steven universe too that you know boys don't have to feel like there's something wrong with them for watching it absolutely um from at nick invincible one uh, they were wondering, what is it like to have gone through such a wide variety of positions in animation? And how do you think that has or will continue to impact future projects you manage? And then also, which ones were your favorite to have? Which positions? I guess. Oh, um, I, uh, you know, I honestly feel like the reason I can be a showrunner is I've always said I'm pretty good at most things uh, in, in production. <laughs> um, I'm still like, I, I could never be a BG designer, an art director, but I can write, I can storyboard, I can character design, I can, um, I can direct. Um, and because I have this multiple, you know, this multitude of skills, even though I don't really consider myself a master at any of them, but because, like I said, I'm pretty good at all of those, that helps me be a showrunner because I can literally help in every department. Um, so I'm pleased, you know, like I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm proud that I tried a lot of different things, um, learned that I was reasonably competent at most of them. And it gave me the confidence to move forward, to, to try to be a showrunner. Um, my favorite stuff is, um, I really loved being an animator. Um, uh, again, like back when we put paper between our fingers, a cats don't dance, iron giant, um, mm -hmm. I sometimes get an opportunity to to um, animate when I'm doing like turns and stuff like that. That's going back to animating, and and I I that that's one of the things that I really zone out on. Um, I think I mentioned this before: the development process, the creating process, coming up with the characters, coming up with the world, coming up with the dynamics, putting it together like puzzle pieces. Um, that I really love. Um, I love story rooms. I love uh, working with other storytellers and working through a story and figuring it out um, for a, a writer to go off and do it. It's it's these these earlier parts of the process I think are I are I really like a lot. Um, yeah, I, I'd say those are my favorite my favorite parts. I, I enjoy uh, going to records as well and working with voice actors. Mm -hmm. That's that's really fun for me as well. Awesome. Uh, well, I think that might be all the time we have. I'd love to ask you about your uh, future goals uh, for your career or just in general, what kind of stuff you would like to accomplish in the, you know, I, months like, and years to come. Oh boy, it's, it, like I said, it's it's kind of a funky time in animation right now. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of interest in new ideas. There's a little bit of a backlash and in interest in ideas for girls at the moment. Um, mm. I'm, I'm trying, I really want to, like I really I'm really interested in trying to tell stories about tweens and and Toil and Trouble mm -hmm. was uh, mm -hmm. um you know Toil and Trouble actually the names of the main characters a, a witch named Toil mm -hmm. and a cat named Trouble 
a black cat named Trouble. And their mm. story was very much, I should say is, <laughs> very <laughs> much about um, uh, how f- uh, friendship dynamics at that age, when, you know, when somebody's one person's 13, they might act a little more 10 and another 13 year old might act a little more 14 or 15. And, and what happens to your friendship when you're at different levels of maturity? There's not a lot of people are really uncomfortable with that age group uh, and with girls. Um, my hope is maybe when the climate's a little better. Um, I've uh, My two shows have been reboots. Um, My Little Pony, DC Superhero Girls, they mm-hmm. were taking existing properties, existing characters, and I'm really happy and um, uh, feel very fortunate that these characters were entrusted to me and I had a pretty high degree of creative freedom on both of those shows, but I'm really, really hungry to do my own thing, my own story, my own characters. Um, that was a big part of what was exciting about being at Netflix all the t- uh, at the time. I had the story and these characters I'd already worked out and I was already in love with. And um, when I got in, it was, you know, creator driven, creator, uh, lots of creative freedom. And um, so I, I started to get my shot in that direction, um, but it uh, didn't work out in the end. So I'm, I'm hopeful that someday I, I can still do that. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 48 in July. So I'm feeling like I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, man, yeah. You have plenty feel, of time. And that's not even. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why we're like this industry. We're all yeah. feeling like you know you you hit your thirties and you're like, ah, yeah, I, it's over. I don't yeah. know. It's yeah. it's fun. Yeah, when I was turning thirty, it was like the worst year of my life. I was just like, wait this till is 40. it. Wait till forty. I know. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm terrified to be honest, but it's like I I got through that. I'll get through the next one. But it's it's um. It, it sucks because it's like, yeah, you see stories of all these wonderkins, you know, and it's like first show at 25, whatever. And it's like, that's amazing. But that's so rare. And um, and most of the time, people really have to grind to get anywhere. And sometimes just to get a, a, a foothold and, you know, and like get their first job, something like it happens in their in people's 30s, 40s. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just a weird toxic thing that we're taught that it's like there's this ticking clock and that. I don't think it's actually true, right? Like, it doesn't really seem like that's true at all. Yeah, as you get older, I think a hard thing for me was that, um, you know, your 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 life starts kicking in. I'm pers- I'm in that phase right now, actually. I, I wanted to take a little break after Toil and Trouble, and then all of a sudden, um, life came to attack. Um, mm. So I'm I'm freelance developing right now um, uh, for other for other people and others projects. Um, Mm. Uh, because I, it gives me, you know, not working 65, 80 hour weeks, uh, Mm -hmm. doing it this way. And I have, uh, more time for my family, um, who really needs me right now. Um, Mm -hmm. so that's, you know, uh, but I'm hopeful, you know, these family issues will smooth themselves out, um, extend, extend, just extended family who, who are going through challenges right now. Um, and then, um, you know, when that smooths out, maybe I can, uh, get back in the game but you know again it's like people aren't really looking for a lot of creative ideas right now or, or uh, original ideas right now they're mm-hmm. they're like optioning children's books optioning comic mm-hmm. books so it's almost like if you have an original idea you've got to make it into a thing first before anybody True. really wants it so hopefully yeah. in a few years the, that that phase will be over and we'll we'll circle back to originals Here's hoping. Open. Yeah. Uh-huh. Time to make a webtoon, y'all. It's time to make webtoons. <laughs> I've been, we've been preaching it like with as, as much as we can, like do your own stuff, like make your own things, yeah. put them out there. Yeah. Cause that's, that's a much more, it's a much more controlled way to get your ideas pushed through. And if things are successful before you hit the studio system, you have a lot more say in, in things, you know, like yeah. you, you can, you can have some a little bit more ownership of your ideas and it's not just handing off your baby to a bunch of people who don't really care right they don't, they're, not, they're not really gonna get or it they right. see it differently like that's that's, that's also true. painful i feel like that's a, a an admirable skill if you're able to go no oh, that's not what i wanted to do but i'll do what you want and still work hard and enjoy myself um because <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's like yeah i'm like i can't <laughs> I think it's also just like a hard thing because I've kind of been in that position of like you know like 
I came with an idea that I I let um, someone kind of like uh, change a lot, but then it's like slowly that also gives the signal, and that's kind of what I mean when we talk about politics and stuff. It kind of gives like a um, secondhand signal that is like, yes, sure, now this is your idea and you're making it however um, you new person wants to make it and I'm a hand. Yeah. It, it, and it becomes this weird thing. And then that co- that becomes like the tacit agreement that it's like, yes, I, I came to you with a sense of design and I'm a good artist. And now you other person get to control this project. And it it's like, I don't know, you know, I mean, like you said, maybe that's, a, that's an admirable quality, but it's also something to be, uh, I think as an artist, very, uh, like do like soul searching and be like, can I do this? This is something I'm comfortable with because it's like when it happens, um, the first time it happens, you know, and you don't know what's happening. I, I'm, I know I'm being very vague because I can't, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of hard to be nitty gritty about this stuff, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just, I feel like it's kind of part of the like whole negotiation politics and all that stuff. Like, do you, you know it's kind of like you're agreeing with someone like yes you can take over this project or like no i'm not comfortable with that which is so hard yeah your boundaries. I, I, I think too especially if you're young and you're getting your first chance you're just so hungry to have yep. it yeah. that you agree yep. to anything yep. yeah yeah like i'm picky you know one one i'm like I go in, I'm like, am I going to enjoy this or am I going to hate this? Um, when I'm being interviewed and when I'm pitching, I, I'm, I'm also interviewing. I'm also kind of going, mm. I'm reading them, I'm asking questions and I'm like, is this a place I want to work? And is this a place that people I want to work with? Um, sure. But that's like, I'm very aware of it's a fault of mine that if I'm not desperately in love with what I'm working on, I don't do a good job. <laughs> but i think that makes sense though yeah. i feel like i think it's like i mean we're creative people it's really really hard to work on something i don't know it's really hard but i know people for, who can know. and they they amaze me they amaze me i i had a, a really good friend who was working on a movie and uh her name's uh jen kluska and um i've worked with her on two projects she was my head of story on medusa and my supervising director producer on superhero girls I love her. I adore her. And I want to work with her as often as I can. She has this wonderful skill where she can work hard and do an amazing job on something, even if she thinks it's a bad idea or she can't hmm. fully get behind it. And I'm, I'm envious because I absolutely mm-hmm. cannot. Um, but I do tell like one of the bits of advice I like to give people, um, especially young people is you know, save your money, like make sure Mm -hmm. you've got some Mm -hmm. savings behind you so you can be picky about what you're working Mm -hmm. on. So, you know, you don't just have, you don't just take a job because you need the cash. I know it's harder to do that these days, but, um, Mm -hmm. you know, if you can, uh, have a, have, uh, you know, a a fuck you fund. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're all like, well, this is a job, but the studio sucks or this is a job and yep. I think this project is dumb. Um, you can you can say no and and wait Absolutely. for something better to come up and um I think that's a a big reason why I've always been able to hold out on t- and wait for projects that yeah. um are really meaningful to me. But I don't have much choice because if I if I'm working on something lousy, I um I, I do a really shitty job. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the well, yeah burnout burnout is a very real thing and yeah. if you don't if you're not enjoying your time on something it's gonna really eat away it's gonna end up eating away at the stuff you do like yeah, right? like yeah. That's, it, it it goes deeper yeah that's it's something yeah like i i've tried really hard to have my own fuck you fun over the years and only last year that I flexed that for the first time because I, I started a job that I was already not sure about and ended up being probably the worst job I ever took. Within two weeks, I ended up quitting because it was so abusive. Yeah. And uh, and it was the sweetest nectar. It was like just to like be able to like, no, fuck this shit. I don't need this. Like it was, <laughs> yeah. it felt so good. Yeah, so, yeah, no, it does. God, I have does. a fuck you fun. <laughs> and F- FYF. Um, awesome. 
that was uh, an amazing episode. Thank you so much for coming on our show, Lauren. Oh, well, you're very, very welcome. And I just want to tell everybody out there, even though I'm being super honest about the, you know, kind of the downside of things, you know, don't let that discourage you. Um, there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's wonderful projects and wonderful executives and wonderful studios out there and everything is in flux. Everything, every studio is constantly growing and changing and leaders come in and leaders come out. So don't, don't get discouraged. Usually at some point there's, there's a beacon of hope, a, a studio that wants to do cool things and um, you can just, you know, hold out for them and, and migrate over there. So um, yeah, pardon me for being, <laughs> so going down the negative path too many times, but, <laughs> but uh, well, it's a beautiful business and, and, a, and, a, and a, just the best medium in, in the world for telling stories and um, it's worth fighting for. We agree. That's why we yeah. do this show. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for having me. This, this was, this was a lot of fun and I'm glad I discovered the pen tool and stopped using the marker tool. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Uh, let's do our little outro. That's the end yeah. of this creative block. Lauren, thank you so much for being our guest and sharing your story. And thanks to your listeners. Follow us on Twitter. It's at Creative Block, Creative Without the Vowels, where we ask for drunk prompts and questions to ask our guests. Huge thanks to your editor, Clements, for editing the podcast and Malik for helping us produce the show. If you love our show, then support us on Patreon. Becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews as well as bonus episodes. Click the link in the description of this episode. I've been your host, Gene. And I was B. Keep being creative, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.